this evening we welcome uh, Dr. Greaves, who will speak about John Garstang. Uh, 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 Dr. Greaves is a senior lecturer in, 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 um, in the University of Liverpool, which is a very famous um, archaeology department. Indeed, one of its members is one of our trustees at the moment. And um, uh, Garstang, of course, is known to many of us who will recall his, his writings and to traces of him in the archives, and always I've been curious about him. So I really am looking forward enormously to tonight's presentation, because I've got all sorts of little questions about him. He seems to have had a very uneasy relationship with Myers, for example, um, which, is, which, which is puzzling, because they really thought we should get on quite well and that kind of thing. But never mind, I'm sure all will become clear, and I'm very pleased to welcome us speaker. Thank you. Well, it's a great honour uh, to be here. Um, a lot of the images I'm going to be showing are archival images from the uh, John Garstang Archives at the University of Liverpool. They are copyrighted at the University of Liverpool, but I asked the director of uh, the museum, um, Nikki Houston, and she's given me permission to use them today and for this lecture to be uh, recorded. So thank you very much to Nicola for that. So this is a long, long, long running project uh, over 10 years ago, I think, when I started uh, this research project. And I'm just one of several people working on glass tank stuff at the University of Liverpool. I just happen to be the one that's working on the Turkish stuff. As you may know, he worked very extensively. Could we have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so the first section is I'm going to talk about Garstang and Liverpool, a little bit about the man, uh, and very interesting about the context of Liverpool. And Liverpool is a really important context uh, for understanding how he operated uh, and what he managed to achieve. So we're going to look at the institution, sponsors and networks that he was able to use to support his work. Then we're going to look at my research project, the so-called Lost Gallery pro project, uh, that the name of that will become uh, apparent later on, and that involves digitizing the collection, making exhibitions, doing uh, outreach activities, a lot of <coughs> outreach uh, activities. And then finally, research findings. So out of that, it's a bit of a reverse of the usual academic process, where you do the research and then we're supposed to have some kind of massive impact and kind of show everybody that you know we've changed the world to what we've done but actually it's been kind of almost in reverse that we uh, out of the digitization exhibitions and outreach we particularly the digitization we were able to come up with some new uh, research findings about uh, uh, about Garstang that go beyond the, the the very obvious stuff that the photos themselves contain Can you have the next slide please so first of all Garstang and the Liverpool so there he is, there's the man uh, in uh, his older days. He was born in Blackburn uh, in northwest uh, England, so quite close to Liverpool. Um, he studied at Oxford. He actually studied mathematics, but whilst he was there, he, he uh, got involved in doing archaeological excavations. Uh, and really, his mentor was Archibald Sates, the famous Hittiteologist. Um, and what's interesting is Garstang was not a great linguist, but he was a very, very good field archaeologist. And so together, the mentor and the mentee made a great partnership. He was also a very enterprising and dynamic young man. Um, so he was made professor of archaeology um, in the early 1900s um, and continued right through until he took retirement during the Second World War, which I was just talking to something about then. And uh, he was working on, say, uh, working on excavations with Flinders Petrie in Egypt, but at Sace's suggestion, he turned his attention towards Turkey, and Turkey was always his great love. He did a lot more work uh, in Egypt because it was easy uh, to do that, but because of the Ottoman antiquities laws, the Anglo-Ottoman political relations, it was always much harder to get permits and access and funding for activities uh, in Turkey, what is now Turkey, what was then uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and also he played a very important role. Um, he was um, the director of antiquities of the British Mandate in Palestine. And when he was there, he modeled some of their antiquities laws on what he'd seen in Turkey. Um, and so uh, he's actually a very important figure within the whole uh, history of the 
uh, of the Near East, um, not just for his academic achievements, which actually I, I think, uh, fair to say, uh, um, are not um, the greatest in terms of publications and, and stuff, because he was always going from one project to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, and he did manage to achieve and publish several great uh, works, but actually uh, he was very much more a kind of a mover and a shaker, I would say, than simply uh, a bookish uh, academic. He also, of course, very famously founded the British Institute uh, at Ankara, so we have an awful lot to be thankful to him for when he was the first president uh, of the Institute. He actually died in Turkey uh, in uh, Mersin, uh, having visited the site of Mersin, he collapsed and uh, died whilst he was visiting the cruise ship. He was a guest lecturer. So really, he started his career and ended his career and indeed his life in Turkey. And he always said that was his great love in, in his autobiographical essay. Uh, in search of knowledge, he always said Turkey was his great love. Thank you. So let's have a look at the University of Liverpool. That's a line drawing of the Victoria Building, which is now the museum. Uh, where we hosted one of our uh, exhibitions. It's the original Red Brick University. Uh, the, the term Red Brick was first applied to Liverpool. So if you think the British Empire is growing, they need lots of dynamic young captains for their army. Uh, and of course, they have to be educated in the classics and uh, that kind of thing. So we have a very long established classics department uh, in Liverpool. If you're going to run an empire, you need a good knowledge of the classics. Um, and so, uh, this term, red brick, was first applied to this building, the Victoria Building, uh, at the University of Liverpool in a rather tongue-in-cheek way uh, by somebody who was actually one of their own academics. Uh, and it's this new wave of kind of, after Oxbridge, it's the new wave of Victorian academic institutions which are going to feed the empire with their brave young men. And Gardstown in 1904 established the Institute of Archaeology at Liverpool. And so this is the oldest archaeology uh, department in the UK. Um, so it really is the place for archaeology in this uh, early 20th century, this the Victorian Edwardian period. Thank you. And it was his base for three projects, uh, two of which I'm going to touch on today, but the main one is actually this first one. So his three projects were his Anatolia survey in 1907, which I'm going to expand a bit on a minute, his excavations at Sanchegazoo in 1908 to 1911. Anyone who's ever visited Ankara Museum will recognize this. This is the central uh, piece of the Ankara Museum, the uh, palace uh, gateway from Sanchegazoo. Uh, and then in his later life, when he was free of his administrative responsibilities to the British mandate, reaching the end of his career, he decided he wanted to go back to Turkey. That was the place he'd always wanted to go back to. So he returned to work at uh, Mersin, where recently uh, there's been new excavations. Um, so that's a uh, important thing. But going back to the Anatolia survey then, this is an interesting thing. Why would you do a survey? Survey we think of as a very modern methodology, but what had happened was he had been, he had requested and been granted the permit to excavate at Boaz Kori uh, but that permit was then taken away from him. But he was already in Turkey with his people and what have you. So he decided to just travel around and try and uh, find out more about this Hittite empire that his mentor, Sais, was so keen that he should follow. So he set off from Ankara, headed up through the Churum province region as we would know it now, visited the excavations at al Jahuya, Hattusha, taking photographs all the time, and then travelled right down into Syria, what is now Syria, into Aleppo, and back up to Gaziantep. And it was during that uh, journey that he chose the site of Sachaguzu to be the one that he would come back and excavate. Uh, and so that's how he chose Sachaguzu. But during that journey, he actually was able to map physically onto a map place names that had Hittite uh, type connotations uh, or connections. He was able to map and locate Hittite style inscriptions in the landscape, um, rock carvings, that kind of thing. And so he created the first map of the Hittite empire. He single-handedly established the whole field 
of uh, Hittite geography with his book, The Land of the Hittites, in 1910. And really, that book is his greatest achievement. And it still stands a lot of his arguments as to this site was here and this one's there and all that kind of thing. We can argue around the edges of it, and of course, we still do in new, ex uh, new excavations, new discoveries will always continue to develop that. But he was the man that really laid the foundations through his travels. And that's really what I want to talk about in more detail today than, than just about anything else. Thank you. So we've looked at Liverpool, we've looked at the man, but let's have a look at some of the networks. So within Britain, he was able to tap into Liverpool's rich industrialists. So he would dress up in this velvet frock coat and go and visit the gentry on a Sunday and dine with them and then say, oh, you hundred pounds is nothing to you. You could sponsor a little excavation or something, <laughs> couldn't you? Um, and so this is how he got his sponsorship. And he managed to get for his uh, Hittite survey had a budget of four hundred pounds. That's one hundred pounds each from four wealthy donors, including Brunner and Mont, who we'll have a look at uh, in a minute. He established the Liverpool Institute of Archaeology and then he was able to employ a technician called Horst Schriefack, a German, but of course this is in the pre-war period. Uh, he went on to have a very colourful career with Horst Schriefack uh, uh, during the First War. Um, but Schriefack was his uh, right-hand man, photographer, he made casts and moulds uh, of Hittite reliefs that they found. So a very useful person. Uh, for God's sake. The newspapers. So now we would blog or we would have followers on Twitter or that kind of thing. But what Garstang did was he wrote lots and lots of stories about his own brilliant researches in Egypt and Turkey uh, and that kind of thing in Times or in the local Liverpool press. Um, that then attracted people to come to his uh, courses at the Institute of Archaeology, which generated money, it generated more interest in people sponsoring his work. And very interestingly, for the Turkophiles in the room, which is, I would hope, all of us as a society like this, uh, he used the Times as a vehicle and he used his network of friends um, to raise money uh, for the uh, Erzincan earthquake. So in 1941 there was an earthquake in Erzincan and he raised thousands of pounds through his sponsors and through running stories about it in uh, the, the Times. So he was again using his networks, his personal skills, his contacts. The main thing Garsang had was his address book and his charm. Um, he used the Society of Antiquities here in London uh, to host receptions. And that's very interesting, we'll come back to that again. But when he gets back from his travels abroad, he comes back and he hosts a dinner. People pay for an invitation to come to the dinner. Uh, they see any of the uh, samples of antiquities he may have been able to bring back. Egypt, being part of the uh, British Empire at the time, much easier to bring artifacts back than it ever was uh, from Turkey. He also had his contact of networks still at Oxford University from his days there. In Turkey, though, he was not without his means. The British Empire in uh, Constantinople, especially Edwin Pierce, was a very important person for him. Pierce managed to get him the permit for Sachigizu by, in the, we've, we've uh, recently published an article where it transcribes the, um, the Ottoman documents relating to the awarding of the permit to excavate at Sachigizu, and basically he pestered them. He pestered them and pestered them and pestered them until they gave him the permit. And what's interesting is it actually included in the application for the permit to excavate at Sachigizu is a map of the site and where he wanted to dig uh, and that kind of thing. And that's also included in the uh, Imperial Archives. Osman Hamdi Bay, we have in the archives of Liverpool correspondence between um, Osman Hamdi Bay and Garstang. Garstang writing, requesting the permit and all that kind of thing. And what's really interesting, and this is where we start to see an insight into the man, is that although he's got all of this British empire, all of these rich industrialists, all of this, these contacts and this prestige and all of the British empire and all that has to offer behind him, the tone of these uh, letters to Osman Hamdi Bey is so respectful and almost obsequious 
It would almost certainly make any of these people reading them cringe to think that he treated a, an Ottoman in, in such a way. But he, he you know, genuinely respected uh, the, uh, the Ottoman uh, authorities, but he also knew that that was what he needed to do to get what he wanted, which wasn't necessarily what these people wanted. He wanted what he wanted. Okay, next one. But also in Turkey, he played upon we know very little, it would be really interesting to know more about Gaussang's uh, religious uh, affinities. He was married into the Gurney family, who were very famous uh, Quakers, uh, and during the First War he served in the ambulance service uh, rather than fighting, and we think that that actually might have been a cause of a big rift between himself and a lot of the other British archaeologists working in the Near East who worked uh, uh, openly or covertly uh, with the, the British military efforts in that part of the world. But he was able to connect with a missionary school in Antep. I've got a lovely photograph of the children in the missionary school all beaming uh, at the camera, probably wondering why, why they're beaming at the camera. Uh, and then also through the contacts he made in that school, he was connected to uh, an itinerant group of Armenian workers who were then the excavators on his site. So his sponsors then, this is um, uh, the head of the Mond family. So Brunner and Mond were two families, and they ran the Brunner Mond Chemical Works. So Liverpool is where all these things are coming in. So actually there are places in Liverpool like Port Sunlight, which is where you get sunlight liquid from the older people in the room might be able to remember sunlight, lemon liquid, detergent, or palm olive because they're bringing palm oil and olive oil in from different parts of the empire and making them into uh, soap uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so Liverpool um, is the port and then further up the Mersey you have sites like Ellesmere Port uh, and Widnes and places like that where there are big chemical factories. So the Brunner family and the Mond family, this is Alfred Mond, Albert Mond, I forget his name. Uh, he's the Mond family, but interestingly, the Brunner family bought this painting by Osman Handy Bay in 1908, which is the year that Garstein was granted his permit to excavate at San Jaguzzi, the young Emir reading, one of the more famous and controversial um, uh, pictures by uh, Osman Handy Bay. Um, and so, also, he was able to use these individuals, their purchasing power, their wealth, to play a game of soft diplomacy as well, uh, by engaging Osman Handy Bay directly with Liverpool and showing him the wealth and the educated elite that uh, existed within that city. And we really do have to recognise that Liverpool at this time was the second city of the British Empire, uh, and extremely wealthy, and so it was a very important thing to do to build up the cultural resources of this city compared to those of, of London. Liverpool was definitely modelling itself on London. You just have to look at the street names, they're all named after London. <laughs> street, we have a pound now, we have Piccadilly, etc. etc. Uh, and, uh, and the whole city is oriented towards the train station. So when you step off the train in London, you are presented with amazing architecture um, so that people from London don't think we're in Berlin or somewhere. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? So that's the context in which he's operating uh, within uh, the UK. So then, um, it was actually the suggestion of my colleague Phil Freeman that I look at the archives from Garnstein's uh, work in Turkey, in particular the photographic archives. So I had the idea of this project, The Lost Gallery. Um, so there had been a Hittite gallery in Liverpool City Museum, but it was bombed in the Second World War and completely destroyed. So the idea was to use the archives and photographs and that kind of thing to actually reconstruct what was in the lost gallery. And so that was the subject of my colleague and friend, Dr. Francois Rutland's PhD, which was funded by the AHRC and National Museums Liverpool as a, a joint uh, studentship where she had a year placement in the stores at National Museums Liverpool doing the archival research and cataloguing the artefacts such as they are. That then led me to think, well, you know what, this would make a great exhibition and we really need to have these uh, glass plate negatives 
professionally digitized in the Great Exhibition using Francoise's research. And then uh, in partnership with the British Museum, we put that exhibition on tour. Thank you. So Blitz of May 1941. Uh, this is the main entrance hall of uh, Liverpool Museum. And you went through Egypt, up, turned left, into the uh, Hittite and Aegean Gallery, which is a small, uh, small gallery in the corner there, and then you came back through um, Roman prehistoric Britain, and then you turned into the main part of the museum, which was the maritime history of Liverpool. <laughs> okay, so what you're doing is you're traveling through time and you're seeing the ascent of culture and civilization from the biblical Egyptians, the biblical Hittites, the Romans in the classical period, to the present day, and the British Empire. So there's this fantastic overarching colonialist narrative to the way that you processed through the museum. And that was one of the outcomes of Francoise's research, that she was able to position the gallery physically and within a narrative of cultural ascent of which Liverpool and the British Empire was the zenith. Okay. But unfortunately, the museum was bombed. Uh, it was hit by several uh, firebombs. Um, Garstang had removed a lot of the artifacts which he had loaned to the Hittite Gallery. Uh, they'd been removed by him, and we don't know where they are. They may have been lost uh, in the war. But what we do know is there were actually very few artifacts in the gallery. Can I have the next slide, please. This is really the only surviving photograph of the gallery. And this is a plas full size plaster cast of the sphinxes from Sachaguzu. Again, if you've been to an Ankara Museum, you will recognize uh, this. You won't see here, but these are actually little human fingers, a whole ring of little human fingers holding up the columns. This would have been a column um, uh, at the entrance to the palace. This is all Aegean stuff, so again, don't get too excited. This is the Liverpool um, Aegean collection. And a lot of these, these gold diadems are replicas. So there's a mixture of replicas and real artifacts. Behind the photographer is a whole wall covered in plaster casts of the reliefs from Yazilikaya, um, and other places, such as of course, uh, in particular. So there were very few artifacts from Turkey on display, partly because, but mainly because he wasn't allowed to bring any out because of the Ottoman antiquities laws. He was allowed to bring a small selection of samples of pottery fragments, and we have the documentation for those, we have the photographs of what went into the sample boxes, we have the letter he wrote to Andy Bay asking for the samples to be forwarded to Liverpool, and so on and so forth. But they were very small fragments of samples of pottery. The main thing is the casts made by Horst Schiefach. But what's interesting about the curation of this exhibition, which was happening in the 1930s when Gaustein was working for the British Mandate in Palestine and he stopped working in Turkey, was there's no evidence that Gaustein was actually involved in it. He had no involvement in the curation of this whatsoever. He had no involvement in the construction of that colonialist narrative of an ascent from Egypt through the Hittites, through the Romans, to um, the British Empire. And very importantly, next one please, the exhibition catalogue is very clearly portraying Garstein as a hero of the British Empire, and he compares him directly um, to Arthur Evans, who discovered the Minoan Empire. Uh, sorry, the Minoan civilization. And so, because in this one gallery you have both of those civilizations, the curators are kind of talking up a story of these guys are both heroes of the British Empire. Each one has discovered an empire the Hittite Empire and the Minoan Kingdom civilization, uh, as we would call it now. And so, they are making a direct analogy between Evans and Garstang. But Garstang played no part, as, as far as Francoise could tell in her research, in uh, the curation of that exhibition and certainly the creation of that colonialist narrative. So we may have formed an impression of Garstang as, especially if we read the catalogue, of Garstang as a hero of the British Empire, but what was the reality we shall see later on. Next slide, please. 
So when we came to work on his photographic archive, uh, his photographic collection consists of 4,000 negatives, 20,000 slides, and photographic prints, papers, letters, etc. Why so many slides? Because, enterprise in Garstang, he would write a lecture and put a set of slides to it about the biblical Hittites or something like that, and then he would rent it out to church societies and historical societies so you could rent an illustrated talk, like this one, which we would pay to come to, and the University of Liverpool would then benefit from that. So he was basically running the uh, Institute of Archaeology as a kind of self-financing research institute. Uh, and his sponsors paid for the excavations, the people who came to the lectures, he was promoting it constantly through talking to the newspapers, etc., etc. So he was following his own agenda and financing it in this way. We managed, as in the first wave of the project, to digitise and repackage 900 uh, glass plate negatives, and those are the collection from Turkey. So there's about 900 from Turkey, including beautiful images like this one. So let's just dwell on this image a little bit. Horst Schlieffak, who was the photographer, was a genius. Okay, These photographs have to be posed. This is not a snap kind of image. This man has been sat and looked. I like to think he's an imam, probably because he's quite well fed. I don't know why, maybe that's a kind of strange prejudice I have. Uh, but uh, he's, he's this, this gentleman sat on a donkey on a road, we don't know where it is. The, the other two donkeys in the background, it's turned slightly so you can see his curly shoes, so on and so forth. Um, so the photographs are amazing. So I'll tell you a bit about negatives. These are not robust lantern slides, these are incredibly delicate. You touch them and they, the surfaces are readily to be damaged. Um, amazingly, most of them survived in pretty good condition. Some of them have been damaged, but most of them are in pretty good condition because they've just been left. That's the most important thing you don't do. Anything with them, they've just been left since Garstein took them. Um, and so what we did was we created a unique um, system for digitizing them. So, can you see how these adjustable clips hold the glass plate negatives by the edges? There is never any pressure applied laterally. There's no, no reason ever to touch the surface. You put them with the glass down and the gel side up. So again, the gel is never touched. It's the, 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 the um, silver gel um, that carries the photographic image. Then, the camera is on a very, very slow exposure, several seconds, which in photographic terms is a lifetime, with a very low level light box underneath. So the glass plate negative is held just by the edges with the gel side up with a very low light level. Then we turn the lights off. This is a dedicated digitization suite in the basement um, of the Garstein Museum. It's held turn the lights off, take a very long exposure, that then creates the image. The image then has to be inverted because we photographed it back to front. And then it also has to be taken from positive to negative because it comes out as an inverted image, but it's also backwards. So it's quite a long digital process, but as you've seen, the results are amazing. For those of us who are old enough, I doubt that's many of you, <laughs> 35mm, these things are the sign of postcards. The quality is amazing. And that's a key point when I come on to the research findings at the end of this. So simply looking at the content of the images, he published, when he published his book in 1910, it was published in Liverpool and sponsored at great expense uh, by one of his sponsors because it had 100 photographs in it. This book was lavishly published with 100 photographs. Um, so only 100 of these images have ever been published. And so the other 700 or so are completely new. Fair to say the best ones were the ones that were published uh, and a lot of the ones 
and that are left are duplicates, but what have you. But they shift some very interesting themes. The first one that you don't really get a, a, a handle of when you're reading the book is landscapes. A lot of photographs of landscapes. And this fits in with the whole concept of the land of the Hittites, book of him traveling and getting a feel for literally the land of the Hittites, where the natural borders between regions might fall because of rivers and inaccessible passes and all that kind of thing. Uh, anybody recognize this place? Mm -hmm. Sidecean Gates. It's the Sidecean Gates, yes. So if you've ever driven from Ankara down to Mersin or the coast, you've driven through here. If you've ever been on a train, you've been through a tunnel. If you've ever been on a car, you've been through a tunnel. This is what it looked like uh, in 1907. Here's a checkpoint. You can see carts, and they just look like what we think of cowboy carts, because that's what carts looked like then, with wheels, with a canvas walking, and all that kind of thing. So lots of landscapes, that's one of the things that comes through. Next one, please. He visited the uh, excavations at Hattusha. Um, and so we have some fantastic photographs of the excavations going on. He wrote a review of the excavations, which was less than complimentary, of uh, what Winkler uh, was doing. He obviously was a bit miffed, but actually he saw his crime, was very gentlemanly, went along um, uh, and uh, did a, a great uh, job of actually creating better photographic documentation than anybody else from those uh, excavations. <coughs> and that's what it looks like now. So we, what we're missing is the stratigraphy. So we can actually see how deeply covered it was uh, before the thing. And of course, he puts a little boy in for scale. And you can see that wow. how well things have been preserved or not. Yeah, keep toggling between them. <laughs> yeah, we can take a good look once more. Yeah, it's the money shot. Okay, so we can see how things have, have changed in the intervening century. Okay, next. Here's one of these Ilikaya. You'll recognize this if you've ever been. And the next photograph, please. This is what it was like when Garnstein went to visit this. So this is it filled. So you can see up to what level. So you can see some burial holes here. Here are the 12 gods of the under underworld and they've already started to excavate back to expose them but uh, originally the soil level was uh, covering them. Okay, so the three themes really that we have are landscapes, archaeology and people. And he was, at the time anthropology and archaeology were joint disciplines the Liverpool Journal was called the Liverpool Annals of Archaeology and Anthropology. He always, and we can see this in the minutes and stuff of the Liverpool Institute, intended that it would be an institute of archaeology and anthropology. And he was definitely what we would call an amateur, but what then they called professional uh, anthropologist. And he was very keen to find which ethnic group within this multi-ethnic Ottoman society were the Hittites. So he's looking at people's profiles and comparing their noses to the noses on Hittite reliefs and all that kind of thing. So a very kind of biological uh, anthropology uh, approach. Uh, so maybe just as well he did really pursue that line uh, of research. Uh, but certainly he was taking lots of photographs. And he uh, clearly identifies who the different communities were. So these uh, people are identified as Kurdish. These are Turkmen uh, women. These people are Jewish, and these are Armenian. So obviously, given what was going to happen within the next few decades, this is a very important uh, document uh, of some uh, past lifestyles and, and communities. OK. And the palace gates at Sachigizu. So we saw that he managed to make a copy of the Sphinx. Anybody spot the mistake there? The Sphinx, when he found it, only had one head. And yet when it was displayed in Liverpool, it had two heads. And actually, it was only in the 1960s that the one in Ankara got its second head. Um, so actually, originally it only has one head, and all of the, what, the, the, other, all of the other copies of that head has been created. He created uh, plaster casts of these that were then uh, mounted on the walls in the gallery, but they were all sadly destroyed. And here you can see the men excavating it that he got through his contacts at the, um, the Christian mission in uh, Gaziantep, who came from Marash, uh, and I believe mostly Armenians. 
next. So, using this amazing resource of Francoise's research onto the kind of colonialising of the Garstang Herit legacy by uh, Liverpool Museum, digitising the photographs, the Heritage Lottery Fund very kindly gave us a very large grant to create an exhibition so that we give Liverpool back its lost gallery. And also that we would create this, which is our education zone. So school groups can sit inside a genuine, genuine um, uh, Europe uh, tent and learn about Garstang. Uh, we created uh, an excavation area uh, and all that kind of thing. We've got a screen running with uh, Garstang's photographs on the loop. Uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is to try and recreate, a, in this education zone, the experience of being on one of Garstang's excavations, but also mixing in lots of genuine Turkish elements as well. That exhibition in one of the Victoria Gallery Museum had over 350,000 visitors uh, over the several years that it ran. This one, I believe, uh, some of you may have visited. This was on Mr. Cloud in Ankara. This is completely different exhibition. Uh, this uh, took its, ex its uh, inspiration purely not from the excavation experience but purely from Garstang's travels. So these panels trace Garstang's travels across Anatolia and there's big maps on the walls and there's a book that goes with, with this one. This is the Animed uh, Research Centre on Istikal. Again got tens of thousands of visitors. Our next one. So in partnership with the British Museum, we put the Garstang exhibition on tour, and these are loans of um, Karkamish reliefs, which featured in the original exhibition, and featured in this uh, exhibition called Lost Empires that went to Blackburn Museum. So Blackburn, of course, is Garstang's hometown, uh, but also an area where uh, the Heritage Lottery Fund and the British Museum were very keen to work with the local museum to get some kind of exposure in there. So it's it's spawned a whole host of exhibitions. Dressing up, so this is the outreach, this is the education area designed by our lovely friend and colleague uh, Kirsty Hall at the, uh, at the uh, Victoria Gallery and Museum. So dressing up box where you can dress up as an archaeologist or as a, a local person and so on and so forth. We have life-size cutouts uh, of some of the people so you could see how to tie your fez on with a headscarf so it doesn't fall off uh, and all that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. We've engaged with the Turkish community. The exhibition was opened uh, by His Excellency, uh, the Turkish ambassador himself. We had 200 people um, from the Turkish community there. Just last week, this, these photographs were taken just last week at a, uh, uh, the reopening of the education zone uh, of the exhibition. And we had 45 members of the local Turkish community from within Liverpool coming and uh, playing excavation and dressing up and, and write your name in q and form and all that kind of stuff. So what's the research? So actually, as I say, this is a bit kind of a backwards project. We started off, yes, with a, a PhD project and a piece of research, but then through that, that led us to the digitization and the exhibition. But what have we actually learned? A lot of the photographs were published. I don't think there's, there's some value, certainly, in looking at those images as images. But actually, we can read them on a much deeper level and get more information out of them. So I just want to highlight really what are the key research findings um, that have come out in the, in the past few years. So just take a moment to look at this photograph. Anybody want to tell me about this photograph? So that's the mound of Sachigazu in the background. I recently visited there. It's right on the Turkish Syrian border. There's the archaeologist, there's Gansta, the archaeologist camp. Perfectly ordinary photograph. Okay, shall we have the next slide? I need you to go very slowly now. Okay. So this is the archaeologist camp at Sachgazu in 1908. Gaussang and his colleagues sit around the table in a very formal posed photograph 
other than the landscape, there's nothing in the image to show it's actually taken in Turkey. Many of the symbols of the British Empire are presented here, so they are visible to the viewer. So what we're doing is we're engaging with the semiotics of this image. And so actually there are signifiers within this that say this is the British Empire. So where's the obvious one? Anyone want to point out? Perhaps the head at the front. The, the pith helmet. <laughs> there is nothing that says British Empire more than the pith helmet. And what's really interesting about Garstein is he knew how to dress. He knew to wear a velvet frock coat to go and visit the gentry. And one of the, he met Ataturk on several occasions, but on one of the occasions he was due to meet Ataturk, he'd just come back from his excavation and he didn't have any clean trousers. So he refused to go and made an excuse, said he was ill and headed out to Anchor on the next train uh, to London, rather than meet the Ghazi in dirty trousers. <laughs> he knew the value of how to dress to impress, and dress was very important. It's not just a secondary thing for Garstang. He very consciously presents himself. So the hat is a key one. Okay, so I've just picked out, I'm sure there are others, but here I've just picked out a few things. So press the next one. The canvas tents. So tents were like this were used by the British military and were very different from the goat hair tents used by local nomads and gas tents and so on. So he's fascinated with tents. There's lots of photos of Europe tents. We have Europe tents in our exhibition. But Gastan is using a British military style tent. It's got a fly sheet here. You may wonder what that's for. It's a sheet that basically just hangs over the tent. And then inside that's to keep the heat off. So that gets really hot and the tent is cool. But actually, a Europe tent is perfectly designed for a tent pile. The air passes through them. When it gets wet, the goat hair expands and then they become watertight. But he's using these British military tents. He would look at this and think, oh, yes, this is, this is the British way of doing things. Next. Mosquito nets. OK, so malaria was a major problem for the British Empire. OK. Liverpool. Uh, is the only other city apart from this one to have a tropical diseases hospital because it's where all the sailors would come back from the empire riddled with whatever they picked up in the empire and malaria was a genuine problem and malaria still until very recently was a problem in this part of Turkey and so Garstang's team here have a technological solution to the, to the malaria problem They've got folding camp beds with built-in mosquito nets over them. Okay? The teapot. Okay, can you see the teapot there? There's a little teapot. There's its handle. There's its spout. Okay? But it's turned precisely towards the camera. Precisely. And there are several photographs of Garstang and his friends having a picnic where the teapot which is a British teapot, it's not a semivare, it's not a Turkish teapot, it's a British teapot. It's turned so we can see it's a British teapot. Okay, it's precisely turned. The flat cap. Okay, we've seen what the local people are wearing, the fez, which is the symbol of the Turkish Ottoman state. But Garsang's wearing the hat that originated in northern England, where he comes from and which was worn by men across Britain and Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. In Turkey, it only became the main form of headwear for men after the Fez was banned in Ataturk in 1925. If you look at Garstang's Mersin archive photographs, um, which are held here in the University College of London, all of the workmen are wearing flat caps. They're dressed like him in 1930s and 1940s Turkey in the early <coughs> Republic. But he is dressed like a foreigner in this. He looks very Western. But Turkey, after the, uh, after the foundation of the Republic, very consciously take on this form of dress. The, the change in the way the workmen are dressed between Garstang's 1908-1911 excavations and his 1938-1943 excavations, is, there's a PhD in there, I'm telling you, for somebody. OK? The table and chairs. The re meaning of this will become obvious later. <coughs> These little folding table <coughs> chairs, they're not sitting on the floor to eat like a, like a Turk. They're sat on 
chairs, they have tables, they have cutlery and plates and, and all that kind of thing. So very different from the traditional dining customs of, of the time. Next, the pith helmet. Yeah. <laughs> First thing we saw immediately. And where is it? It's dead center. It's dead center. It couldn't be more in the middle. It couldn't be more prominent. This photograph is totally curated. The whole image has been curated. It's been posed. It's been composed. And it's made from Indian cork, part of the British Empire. Why? And I said to this to the Turkish kids the other day when they were playing, we've got pith out, of course, in our dressing up box. Look at me, I'm an archaeologist. I think it takes a little bit more than that, but you're halfway there. Okay, why a pith helmet? We don't have sunglasses. So the broad brim keeps the light out of your eyes. You haven't got sunscreen. So it keeps the sun off your face. Because if you're not white, how do they know that you're superior? So this becomes the quintessential image of the British Empire, and it's dead <laughs> The saddle. This is really interesting. Again, it's it's curated. You know, this isn't somebody who's just kind of been out for a canter and just thrown the saddle off and, you know, brushed the horse down. It's been turned so you can see where it is. And why? Because when you look at Garstang's accounts, and this is what we're doing with this project, it's a complete interdisciplinary thing. When you look at his accounts, which are held in the archives of the University of Liverpool, a quarter of the budget went on horses. So he's basically saying, this is what your money went on. Mm -hmm. Okay, have the next photo. There are lots of pictures of horses because this is where a lot of the money went. Workmen, horses, transport. This is where all the money went. Okay, we're going to do the same again now. Okay, so let's just, <laughs> just pause for a moment. Have a look at this image. What's different with this image? They're sitting on the floor. They're sitting on the floor. Apart from the deck chairs. Apart from the deck chairs, yeah. And who's sitting in the deck chairs? Oh, some Brit, some Brit. One Brit, and the other one's empty. So they're actually, they have chairs, but they've chosen to sit on the floor. Mm. Anything else? Well, the very Turkish floor covering things. Yeah. Very Turkish kilims, they're sitting on kilims, very Turkish. Anything else? In the headdress, head. the cab bed in the background. Yeah, but it's folded down, it's just kind of there. It's not center, it's not. So, this is not a posed photograph. You can see that some of the people have moved, so some of these faces are blurred. That chap there, you can see it was a windy day because the trees are moving in the background, but that chap hasn't been told to stand still and be photographed. So, this is not a posed photograph, this is more candid. I'm not saying it's entirely un. Pose, but it's more candid. And so this is how he actually got the job done. So on one hand, you have this very self-consciously curated image for your audience. Remember, he comes back from his travels, he goes straight to the antiquaries, has a lavish dinner, and he gets out his photo album. And the photo albums were for display at those dinners. So in that social space back in the UK, he shows them those photos and says, oh, thank you very much. Oh, look at the quality of that saddle. I know it's looking a bit expensive, but look at the workmanship on that saddle. It's lovely, and so on and so forth. Of course, we wore our pith helmets all the time, uh, and all that kind of thing. Should we go through the same again, deconstruct this image? So this was taken at Rwanda Kalisi in Kiris, which was a site that I surveyed um, in 2004, I think, of 2000. Yeah, 2004, I surveyed Rwanda Kale. Um, and the reason he went to Rwanda, why do you think he went to Rwanda? Rwanda Kale, see? It's the Anda, the Anda name. Mila Wanda, Miletus, so on and so forth. He thought it was going to be a Hittite site. But actually, I've asked David Hawkins about this, and the RAF sound does not exist in Hittite or Lui, and it must be. Um, its name was actually Ravandel, which was the name of a French um, crusader family that built the castle, and then it's being conjunct, it's been formed a conjunction, etc. Et <laughs> so he went there because he thought their name was cool. And actually, there's Roman stuff there, it's a really nice site, but it's not Hittite. 
So he's sitting on the ground. He's got a map and notebook. We have that notebook. It's in one of the archives. And it's got all his notes on what would become the, um, uh, well, actually, one of the notebooks I'm talking about is the uh, Satchel Cruiser Excavations. But that, would, that notebook would become the land of the Hittites. And he's taking notes. And he published his photograph to say this is how we actually did it. What language are they talking? What do we think? Arabic. 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 So that might be one of the reasons why he chose such a visit, because the local people, and I worked at an excavation in Kilis province, and the population there is still mixed, uh, Kurdish, Turkish, Arabic. So he knew, he knew enough Arabic to get by. But what's interesting is in the back of his such visit notebook are four pages in the back of the notebook of Turkish crib sheets. He was learning Turkish, and certainly by the end of his life, he knew very, very good Turkish. And that was talking to who? To the bus. Hmm? To the workers? Yeah, the workers, yeah. The Temsuji. Okay. The, the government watchman. So every excavation has to have a government Temsuji, a, a, a commissar. Um, and also for the workmen, so we have words like dig, go deeper, well, bucket, all that kind of thing. And what's really interesting, for those of us who know Turkish, is they're all in the sen form, which if you're living in a Turkish village, is what everybody uses. None of this is business, um, it's the sen form. So he's using the familiar form. There's no halabalinis in his lutfen or anything like that, it's just git, go, get it. <laughs> That's Turkish, village Turkish. But Actually, he could have got by with his Arabic, but he actually was making the effort to learn Turkish because he knew the importance of getting in with the right people, the Temsilji, Hamdi Bey. Um, when he excavates at Mersin, the first thing he does is make a silver trowel so the local uh, Belediye Bashkan can cut the first sod on the excavations at Mersin with a silver trowel, which he's never mentioned again. So I wonder where that silver trowel is now. I bet somewhere uh, it's in the uh, in the bottom drawer of the uh, the Belgian Bashkan of of, of Mersin. So he knew how to get things done, and he was a very clever uh, at getting things done. Relaxed postures. They're just friendly. They're sitting as equals um, on the ground, chatting. So this is not the usual image you would expect of meeting of people from great empires who, within a decade, were going to be at war. Uh, with each other. This is a person who has a thirst for knowledge, who wants to know stuff, who's got no agenda other than his own, of how can I get things done? What do these people want? What language do they speak? How do I need to dress or act in order to, to get what I need, which is not this knowledge. I want this knowledge of where the Hittite signs are. Next. The rook. So unlike the previous one where they sat uh, on their folding tables and chairs, which obviously with them, they've obviously got the whole kit with them. They're just like, you know what, just sit on the floor. A few deck chairs out, what have you. So there's no pretense to maintaining British social etiquette. He's not saying, oh, well, we're going to have tea and you can come and join us and then I will grill you for information. He's like, come on, let's all get down on the rug and talk about where does this valley lead and are there any place names that end with Ander near here and all that kind of thing. Next. Shalvar. It's hard to tell, but it looks like this man here is wearing shalvar, and in other photographs, this person, whoever he is, um, was de he's definitely seen wearing a Turkish head headscarf. He wears a headscarf for a lot of the time. Garstang is photographed wearing a headscarf, and then there's one, really, it's, it would be laughable if it wasn't so kind of serious, where he's wearing absolutely brilliant white suit and pith helmet, and he's standing on top of a trench like this, and he's pointing, and they're all digging up at him like this. Pecky <laughs> Effendi. Uh, and then the next one, you can see Garstang's broken down into laughter, and even, even he can't keep a straight face as he's standing there in this pristine white suit, and even he's la laughing and what have you. So a lovely smile on some of these photos. And then there's another one where he's at the bottom of a trench and they've just made a big discovery, and he's beaming like this. You know, he's obviously just totally loving the day. And the camp beds and the saddles and all that kind of stuff, 
that is shifting back there. Okay, so what we can see is that Garstang embodied his agency. He lived his experience and he was what we would call a transcolonial agent. He operated within the British Empire and he operated within the Ottoman Empire and they didn't exclude one another, he actually took the best of both of them. He could dress up as a white colonialist when it suited him to do so and he could just get down and dirty on the floor in a headscarf when it suited him to do so. It was actually empowering for him to be a member of two empires and to work both of those networks and societies um, in order to get what he wanted. So he is not an agent of empire in the classic colonialist sense. Neither can he be constructed in a simply post-colonialist way. He was a truly free transcolonial agent and his only desire was what he wanted, to run his institute, to finance it, which sometimes meant doing things that we might not always consider ethical these days. Um, he certainly was not above prostituting himself and going for dinner with people and hosting fancy dinners and showing uh, cur courtesy to people uh, in whatever circumstances. But his main thing was the pursuit of knowledge and his desire to learn more about the Hittite Empire. So that's one way in which we've simply been able to deconstruct the photographs in a different way and get something more out of them than simply the image. We're actually reading the image, breaking it down into signifiers and semiotics and all that kind of thing. The next one will blow your mind, okay? This boring photograph, you think, what a boring photograph? <laughs> this is the section edge at the Great Temple in Hattusha whilst it's being excavated. We can pin down almost to the day when this photograph was taken. And these are tablets. In situ. Now, 28,000 tablets have been published from Hattusha. None of them in situ. Garstang writes that the excavations were poor. Somebody else writes that Vinkler was excavating tablets out of the ground like they were potatoes. And it just oh, got a local workman to dig them out. Garstang was a brilliant field archaeologist. He was surprised to see what they were doing. Once more. So here's one tablet. Take a look at it, memorize it. There's another tablet. Remember when I said how amazing the quality of these glass plate negatives are, and how we had that very special system for digitizing them. Next slide, please. We have been able to digitally modify the image to make these legible. So we've actually been able to identify which tablets these are. And again. And these two tablets, so if you want to go back through those three, please. So that one, I think is the second one, and that one I think is the first one. Or is it the other way around? Okay. That's the first one, yeah. That's the second one. And we digitally manipulated them, we've stretched the image, zoomed in, focused it, all that kind of thing, in order to make it legible. And the really amazing thing is that these, so when they came to translate the tablets and all that kind of thing, they put them into series according to what the subjects are and where they think they came from. So there's a series of oracles and a series of uh, other documents and what have you. These come from two separate series. So the temple archives were actually a dump. They were redeposited. They were not in situ. Um, and so that is a, a really major, major development in our understanding of the Hittite archives. The two completely separate series were found side by side in almost certainly a dump deposit. And it's this one image and the way we've been able to manipulate them because the digital image isn't just a photograph, it's an artifact. You can actually alter it, like we've done here. Um, next one, and then I need to take over the laptop from you, please, my friend. This is the inscription uh, which is published by David Hawkins as Hisagic Iki. Uh, it's a Lurian inscription from a site called Top Nefes, or what Garstan called Top Nefes, which we call Hisagic Iki now. This was destroyed in 1992. 
magazine was published um, at the start of this century by Hawkins in his um, uh, in his um, uh, corpus of Lewin inscriptions. But what I want to show you is what we've been able to do with it. So we've been able to create a 3D model of it and then apply a technology to it called RTI which allows us to read it from all kinds of different lighting angles. And what Garstein had done, so if we move this over here, we zoom in a bit. So what Garstein had done is he had taken a series of photographs. So you can see there um, a symbol here, and then there are some other symbols down below. Um, what Garstein had done is he'd taken a series of photographs from different angles um, as the sun sets, and this is what you would normally do. But what we've been able to do is take Garstein's photographs so you can see now then that here there's another symbol emerging move it over to here, it's clearer still. <clears throat> so it's not great, but these, this is a 3D model constructed from photographs that are over a hundred years old and then constructed in virtual reality and then from that they've then been passed through this program called RTI um, which allows us to illuminate in that way. So what we've been able to do is we've actually produced a new reading of the inscription not only 110 years after it was photographed but actually 20 or 30 years after it was destroyed um, and so this I mean, at the uh, Institute, uh, the Royal Institute of Anthropology is famous for its archival collections. And, you know, you can look at images of people and construct them, but actually what you can do now that we have them digitally is treat them as digital artifacts to make 3D models, interactive visualizations like I've just demonstrated there, to create new understandings of what these ancient texts, inscriptions, or buildings, you can create 3D models of buildings, I think that one, I think people know about, but the actual the application of the RTI thing. So we've actually created a new uh, reading of this inscription that will be published together with the uh, tablets in a forthcoming article in Shalap, in um, Anatolian studies or something like that. So last slide then, so just to sum up key points, Garstang's a big figure in British archaeology, but we don't really give him the credit he deserves. His legacies are undervalued or often inaccessible because they're photographic. He's not just books. He did so much more than just write books. He played an important role in the cultural, intellectual, and colonial history of Northwest England in the early 20th century. So we've got somebody who is not coming from the Oxbridge, Cambridge, London Triangle. You've got somebody who's actually trying to establish a kind of intellectual culture, a scholarship of Hittiteology and so on and so forth, away from the colonial metropolis. And he isn't doing it in a purely colonialist way, he's doing it in a trans-colonialist way to suit his own agenda. His photos can be read from a post-colonialist perspective, uh, his archive also shows the importance of post-digitalization post post analysis. So many archives, like for example the Gertrude Bell archive, scanned, posted online, everyone goes, well, a photo book, a coffee table book, but we're not really working with the technology of digitalization if we don't think, well actually this isn't just an image, this is a file, this is a data file that can be manipulated uh, in various ways in order to create readings of fine detail, in order to create completely new readings of lost artifacts uh, and so on and so forth. And these are our sponsors. This project has lasted over a decade and we've had multiple sponsors and we're very grateful to all of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>